Hello there everyone, I'm Mr. Mocha Lover, and thank you for joining me here in TNO, The Last Days of Europe, in which we're going to read and look at the Kingdom of Altai, with his siblings and father missing or dead, and the dream of Russia being demolished. Boris Karailov has reluctantly taken up the legacy of the Mad King, though with considerably less eccentricity. Having spent some time leading a mixture of Russian and Tuvan partisans in the Altai Mountains, it's finally emerged to begin the process of rebuilding the region. Boris is uncertain whether he wishes to retain the title of king, but its value as a tool of unification is indisputable, and his kind treatment of non-Russians has endeared them, endeared him to them. Very, very cool. And we're boarding the Siberian Free Territory, and we have Boris I. For the Fallen. Three coffins lay before the kneeling form of Boris Krylov. They were empty, of course. Nobody knew exactly what had happened to his family, but they were most certainly dead. Tears streaming down his face as he prayed for the salvation to a god who had long since abandoned Russia. He thought of his father, crazy yet brilliant in so many ways. He thought of his brother, who had so loved the people. He thought of his sister, who, the strongest woman he had ever known. Now, there was only him. When the empire finally collapsed, Boris had been the only man in the region with any sort of clout. The people looked to him now to guide them through the trials that lay ahead. Of course, he had agreed, but now he found himself sick to the stomach as it, at the trepidation, trepidation of it all. He had always been the quiet one of the family, content to stick to administration and bureaucracy. He was not a leader, but he could hardly compare to his father or his siblings. But if he could not lead the people, who could? The people of Altai were broken and lost, and he was all they had left. He fought the temptation of to confine himself to his tent and drink away his sorrows. He knew he would not be the best leader. But for the sake of all of his subjects, for the sake of his family's legacy, he would give it all. Give it his all. He stood and reached for his father's coffin, upon which sat the crown that had once adorned his head. With trembling hands, Boris Krylov adorned it upon his own head. He caught his reflection in a nearby window. He thought he looked ridiculous, yet he stowed, or stowed his doubts and his fears. And with a heavy heart, he strove from the church to greet his subjects. He resolved to do what he could do to lead them. For what else could be done? For father, for the family, for everyone with the national spirit. The practical kingdom of church of political power and ideology drift defense, but more stability. And of course, a tasty, salted earth. Very test test here. Authoritarian democracy is pretty popular, as well as conservative democracy. Jim Brown leads liberal democracy, as well as dudism Johannes Williams, but an impasse. I'm sorry, but we can't just spare the soldiers. We've already overstretched keeping the bandits out, said Major Ivanov. His tired features scrunching up in frustration as he stared across the council table at one of the many peasant representatives. You can't expect us to sit around waiting for our houses to get burned down by some bloodthirsty thugs. You have to help us with the enemy within, came the hoarse reply from the representative. King Boris was already getting a headache, but despite the dull pain overwhelming the back of his skull, he continued to strain to follow the conversation. It was anarchy, with officials yanked from all walks of life competing for their own needs, to be met in a land that was drowning in loss and brimming with need. The clergy, the soldiers, the farmers, the workers, all wanted things they could not have, so, so much was being said, pleaded for, promised with crossed fingers, as the Lord says, Dudes, fifteen troops, has to be, this week alone, crematoriums. The words rushed past Boris as he tried to push through the fog, overwhelming his mind, struggling to understand where the conversation had even wandered off to. Sweat beaded on his forehead as the words continued to blend together, until his head was simply filled with rushing white noise. Now they were all looking at him, waiting for an answer to a question he hadn't heard. What was he supposed to tell them? He was just a general. This was the least he could do for his people, try to lead them, and yet he could still do so little. Boris sat up, straightening a crown he never wanted. Weathered by the years, the council's eyes beat down on him like hail. Someone tried to break the silence, hoping for an answer from the beleaguered king, your majesty. I, uh, could you repeat that? Cool. Controlled opposition, all trade unions allowed, free press, universal voting here under Boris the first. Very cool. Early export, or limit exports, early mobilization, low pensions, low unemployment assistance, not applicable for income taxation, tax rate, but weary beyond words. Boris gazed down the hill towards the stream, bubbling as it made its way gently across the gl clear green pasture. As the Rosina were relaxing by the stream, chattering among themselves and noise competing with the gurgle of the water, Boris, a few dozen feet above and behind them, and perched on the hillside, gripped a handful of soil where his hand rested for support. Exhaustion tugged at his limbs and wore away at his mind almost always, but right now he was able to refine respite beneath an open sky. Calm moments were rare nowadays, and Boris tried to enjoy it as much as he could. However, despite the softness of the grass, the noise of the stream, the majesty of the mountains beyond, and the pleasant breeze brushing cheerfully past his faith, he still couldn't rid his mind of worry. 
the pastures beneath. The foothills of the Altai Mountains were beautiful this time of year, as were the mountains themselves. The craggy giants, dusted with snow, were painting a dreamy purple by distance, sky and shadow. It startled Boris to know that, at least in the words of humanity, a people so often wrong and arbitrary in their claims. These great beasts of stone belong to him. They were a testament to the responsibility he had now held and could not in good conscience release. They had seen so many rulers over the years, including his own father. The old man seemed so invincible in his leadership of his territory right up until the end. He ruled with dignity, grace, and power. He was a man truly worthy of subjugating mountains. Boris did not feel that way at all. So, he sat, stared at the clear blue sky, and asked himself, What would father do? Outlawed, traditional rules, equal rights, police, minimal safety regulations, very cool, and few pollution regulations as well. <clears throat> and happy 1975, everyone. Brothers in victimhood, Boris was puzzled when he received word of the delegation from the east. Very few traveled so far these days, and the men who had arrived were apparently from a group of Mongol pastoralists. What they could do, or what they could want so far from the home, especially after the people were so horrifically slaughtered by Tabaritsky's forces, was a mystery. Regardless, they were technically a subject, so Boris agreed to hold an audience with them. The delegation were a sorry bunch. The clothes were ragged. Many looked half-starved, and a few lacked limbs, eyes, and other body parts. Yet the leaders, an elderly Mongol who, Mongol who walked with a limp, smiled warmly as he approached. Greetings, your majesty, he said in broken Russian. We have come bearing aid for your people. We have brought food for the hungry and yurts for those without homes. He gestured behind him at their wagons, loaded up with cheeses, dried meats, and bundles of fabric. Boris stared agape at the supplies and then back at the men. You bestowed this on us? Even after everything that has happened to you, surely your people need these supplies. The old Mongol shook his head. Our people suffer, yes, but so do your, yours and all the people of this land. We're all brothers in victimhood now, and it's just that we do what we can to help each other. My only regret is that we cannot bring you more. Boris found the words suddenly escaping him. In truth, the supplies were not much. They would feed and house a few dozen people at most. Yet these people who had so little of themselves, who had every reason to hate Russians for all that had happened, had come offering what they could to help him and his subjects. Fighting back tears, he could only utter a breathless few words of gratitude. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let's see. Academic base. Poverty. Equipment and expertise are all improving, which is nice. Army professionalism, nuclear stockpile, agriculture and research facilities, however, it's not. Once more with feeling, Boris smiled struggingly through the coughs as he watched the fading glow of the cigarette butt sail through the gloomy dusk fog and suddenly snuff out as it hit the river a few meters behind him or below him. For a moment, he wondered if the faded German magazines the camp had used as toilet paper the previous year had spoken true, and the smoking caused a cough. He casts the thought aside, though. There were a thousand dreadful, ordinary things that could cause a cough in the misty ruins of Russia. What matter was smoking helped. He opened the pack for another, but yeah, chucking the empty pack away, he marched back to his tent. No use asking the quartermaster. Boris had already squirreled away whatever leftovers of real tobacco could be found. After fruitlessly searching for several minutes, he could do little but sit down on his bed in frustration and take swigs from an old bottle of vodka to staunch his coughs. He couldn't even find his own darn crown, much less some smokes. He wanted to cry, but he knew he couldn't. The men outside, while rough men dressed in little more than filthy rags and old ushankas, all looked to him as a leader. But the last Nyaz and the, of the Rus was lost as his men. His siblings had always known what to do, what to say, but Boris was lost, only moving forward out of a vague sense of duty to his lost family and a desire to help. The starving villagers of Russia, his men, himself, he hardly knew any longer. The memory of his father stirred something in Boris, and he looked at the pile of books and papers he had thrown on the floor, looking for smokes. At the top lay a faded copy of his father's Sayings of St. Simeon. One of the books Rurik had read when lost in despair, maybe it had all been his trick, but he picked up a book, and his copy became a faint memory as he scanned the pages with widening patterns, or widening the eyes, patterns, order, faith, hope. He scooped up the rest of the books and returned to his bed, trick or no trick. Maybe there was something greater play. King Boris had something to read to do. Very cool, my friends. If you enjoyed the video, though, leave a like. Subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I will see you tomorrow in another video. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.